If everyone can take their seat, please. And if I can have the speakers uh, or the panelists uh, join up here. Professor Cooley, when he ended the last panel, mentioned that we're now going more into detail, which is something actually that I do like because the other is visionary, is strategic, and what does it do? And I like that old German phrase that has now become common in the English language, the devil is in the detail. Uh, this after this still this morning, which is going to stretch into the afternoon before we go to lunch, we have four panelists who will look at different aspects, particularly of gas, all in the China's energy, and gas is one of the names of the game. We have Shamil, who is from the UK but originally from Russia, who has become a noted expert in the Russian gas market as well as in the entire energy space. We have also a scholar from China who's going to be presenting the Chinese position and in that particular order. Then we have two more devil in detail, Ed Conway, who although he is now with the private sector, he also has a scholarly background, so he's hiding, so to speak. Uh, and last, we will end with someone a little bit further north that there's a school up there, I, I don't know, I've lost contact up in, in Cambridge, uh, from Harvard, who will also bring more devil in the detail. The reason it's important to do devil in the detail is visions are nice. They make us feel good or they may make us feel bad. But the, the detail is, tells us how to get there, if we can get there. It's the same thing that was said in this morning's panel by Richard in one respect. Afghanistan is terribly rich in natural resources. There's one little question that no one has really answered or addressed. How do we get the resources out? It's a very simple little question, but the answer is very is baffling the Chinese, is baffling everyone. How do we get it out? That's the devil in a detail question. So let's hear it about gas. We'll start off with Shamil as first, and in the order that I mentioned, Bin the second, and then uh, Ed, and then Morena. And you can either stick there or join up here as you wish. And by the way, I'm going to, I have a Germanic background. That means I'm going to play policeman to keep everyone honest and moving the presentations forward. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be back at uh, Columbia University. Uh, this is now eighth pipeline colloquium. And uh, which means that pipelines are still very important despite developments of uh, in LNG markets, and I will mention that uh, a bit later in my talk. So what I'm going to talk today, uh, I'll present a more or less uh, uh, a bigger picture approach uh, when it comes to relationship between China and Russia, uh, particularly uh, how China uh, developed its strategy towards, China, uh, towards Russia, how Russia, uh, in some ways, different place within Russia uh, develop different strategies towards China. I will talk a bit about Rosneft and Gazprom, uh, and then how how the markets are not changing that relationship. Not only markets, but also politics, internal politics within Russia as well, but also international relations. I'm not going to talk about Crimea, but one thing I will, I will just mention that that obviously is changing Russia's attitudes. Uh, and then I'll start with first. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for Russia's relations with, uh, with China uh, have been the way they view their uh, gas strategies and their gas relations. Uh, as you know, Gazprom, uh, from the very beginning, uh, was interested in becoming a swing producer. When they started talking about uh, developing their gas strategy, 
they were very interested in uh, building ties with China on the basis of the same type of gas reserves, resources uh, that were destined for European markets. And these gas, gas resources are predominantly located in West <coughs> Siberia. Um, so the idea of a gas problem was to build a pipeline from the Altai region in Russia to China, uh, which would enable uh, uh, them to supply gas volume from West Siberia. The Chinese were not particularly happy with the idea of uh, being dependent on the same type of resources as European consumers. They didn't want to undermine their relationship with the European Union, so they insisted of using East European, uh, sorry, East Siberian gas volumes. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, the Chinese were, and also another issue for that was is Siberian gas volumes are easier to deliver to northeast regions of China, uh, unlike uh, West Siberian gas volumes. Nevertheless, the Chinese were, uh, uh, were still considering an option of uh, using those gas volumes uh, and uh, to, to put those gas volumes into a uh, uh, westeast uh, pipeline within China, which they were expanding. However, a number of issues interfered uh, one of those issues was uh, calculating the price of gas, because the Chinese wanted that, that gas to be linked to, uh, you know, linked more to coal, because Russians wanted to be based on, uh, on European prices, and then oil link prices. Uh, and then Gazprom also was uh, concerned about being too, too much dependent on China, and they wanted access to more markets within Asia. At the end of the day, uh, China opted for Central Asian gas, uh, having had uh, uh, relationship with, with Gazprom uh, or that negotiation is being stalled for, for a long period of time. But Gazprom didn't really want to give any equity to Chinese, whereas uh, Central Asian producers were very, very uh, keen on giving equity, which means that the Chinese companies will develop gas, build infrastructure, and then bring that gas to uh, uh, their own domestic market. Um, apart from that quite problematic relationship between uh, Gazprom and, and uh, uh, and China, relationship between Rosneft and China have been somewhat uh, different. Uh, as that depends obviously on a number of issues, uh, simply because uh, one, one issue was that the Chinese really needed volumes, additional, secure additional volumes of oil from Russia because of the decline of uh, tanking, I don't know how to pronounce this correctly, tanking uh, oil field uh, in China. Oil price was not an issue since uh, uh, you know, you know, oil and gas market are very different, and uh, uh, oil is a really international market, international price. And uh, well, one interesting thing is um, they offered they offered loans to Rosneft, and Rosneft needed those loans first uh, in order to take control over the assets uh, of Yukos uh, company, which belonged to to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky and his business partners, which were dismantled by the Russian authorities. Uh, and then, subsequently, the Chinese provide, provided uh, a loan which helped uh, Rosneft to uh, limit its exposure, financial exposure, after they, they took over, uh, took control over uh, TNKBP uh, joint venture, which was jointly owned by uh, uh, three Russian billionaires, uh, AI Consortium and, and uh, BP. Um, this helped the Chinese to... Um, rely on Igor Sechin's um, uh, position and political uh, standing within the Russian establishment uh, to, uh, in some ways, put in direct, indirect pressure on Gazprom uh, to reach an agreement with the Chinese. So Rosneft really de facto uh, became lobbyist of Chinese interests within the Russian political establishment. Um, and um, having, having absorbed uh, loans provided by China, uh, Rosneft committed to supply oil volumes uh, and increase oil volumes from 300,000 uh, barrels to 1 million barrels a day now. Uh, this coincided with a this, with this change in, in, in uh, energy markets and also within the Russian establishment because in Russia, different companies provide two types of service. They provide the market service where they're responsible for a specific segment of market within Russia and for generating rents for both the society and also the elites. Uh, and also uh, their political role as stabilizers for the budget, but also their political role within the system 
uh, of uh, these elite relationships where different elite groups, uh, where, where the Kremlin tries to balance different elite groups uh, and that basically corporate assets are used uh, to give power or re reduce power of certain individuals, of certain companies within that system. Uh, and what happened is that um, uh, Igor Sechin uh, really became uh, not only a lo lobbyist of, uh, tax for tax breaks uh, for Russian oil industry, but also he became a lobbyist for uh, removing uh, LNG monopoly, uh, that monopoly that the Gazprom had on LNG exports. Uh, Sechin really started pushing for East Siberian development of oil, but also uh, making, making sure that uh, in, in some ways this, this, this created uh, more pressures on Gazprom to start looking more towards East Siberian gas. Um, and then um, uh, another, another issue was the development of ESPO pipeline, East Siberia Pacific Ocean pipeline, as a new benchmark, uh, potentially a new benchmark um, which Russia is seeking to develop in Asian markets. And this uh, leaves us in today where we have uh, a new project, Power of Siberia Pipeline, which Gazprom uh, is planning to develop. Um, and um, apart from the issues I've already outlined, there were some other issues. Uh, one issue is obviously the problems on the European front, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, market issues within Europe. It's still a very, quite a depressed market. Uh, and also political issues, the, the European, European desire to diversify away from Russian gas following the Russia-Ukrainian gas wars, and also um, you know, the recent developments uh, talking about after, after the Crimean, uh, uh, you know, Crimean, Russia took over Crimea, uh, to diversify away from Russian gas, which, um, which somewhat creates uh, uh, more challenges for Gazprom because Gazprom is now more pushed to, towards uh, Asian markets, as already been <coughs> mentioned earlier uh, by, by Alex. Uh, and um, as a result, uh, Russians are now more, uh, how can I put it, conducive to building their relationship uh, with China. Um, and um, the fact that uh, Rosneft is now becoming a new gas player, which is push, putting additional pressure on Gazprom. Uh, and uh, Rosneft is now seeking to use the power of Siberia pipeline, which Gazprom is planning to develop to supply its own gas volume. So we'll see potentially uh, more uh, battles between different players within Russia to supply gas to Asia. Uh, this is basically completely changing the landscape, both within Russia and, and, and outside of Russia, uh, to boost uh, the role of China and Asian markets. Um, and. Um, the Chinese basically now have a dilemma whether, whether they, they should wait and see how uh, LNG markets will develop or whether they should secure pipeline gas. And in some ways, they're actually in a better bargaining position than Russia uh, because um, uh, the pricing issue is becoming is, is become less, less of an issue for, for, for uh, Russia-Chinese uh, negotiations because of the pressure that's coming from North American uh, uh, you know, market. Uh, the fact that it's completely changed in the whole of the price structure already within Europe, uh, the delinking of uh, prices of gas, you know, delinking them from oil prices, uh, the fact that is uh, uh, Henry Harp is now becoming, uh, uh, I'll talk about that later, uh, Henry Harp beca becoming a, a, a new benchmark uh, for for gas uh, for gas prices. So, 2020, there is a talk about potential LNG glut. Uh, because of, uh, you know, we have seven Australian LNG projects coming on stream after 2018. Uh, we have North American LNG projects, and you know that uh, the Department of Energy have approved, I think they've already approved about uh, uh, they've done five, five projects so far uh, to export LNG from the United States. Uh, and it's a game changer. And also, uh, with an addition of uh, East African LNG, uh, the question of how that LNG glad where it will the first question is whether there will be an LNG glut or not. And the second question is who will absorb that additional supplies of LNG and how LNG is changing the strategy uh, of China towards uh, gas, gas supplies by pipeline from Russia. At the moment, of course, Asian markets are the most attractive market for gas producers. They're fighting to get access to that market. Uh, simply because the US market is not self-sufficient, is no longer considered an attractive market for, obviously, for uh, for, uh, uh, for outside producers. 
European markets, as I mentioned, is a depressed market. It's still important for Russia because of uh, revenues and because of traditional links. Um, uh, I mentioned already that North America is changing price, pricing issues uh, in the Asia, Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, some people say, yeah, well, if we have these additional LNG volumes, perhaps it's, 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 you know, they, can, they can be dumped in Europe. It is true, but uh, Asian market is more interesting because of the price difference uh, with European markets where you, you, when, when you make a premium of three to four dollars per MBTU. Uh, and um, another issue is which, which of the markets will absorb those LNG volumes? Because we have a free trade agreement with the, between the United States, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, obviously, they don't, need, uh, they don't require any additional permissions to, uh, to absorb those LNG volumes, coming particularly from the United States. Uh, and China, with their subsidized pr prices, uh, with more regulated markets. However, um, if the, the other problem with mature OECD markets, Japan and South Korea, that they, they are quite, um, uh, from an economic point of view, they're not as attractive, they're not as growing as, as a fast growing Chinese economy. And this obviously will affect the way uh, these LNG volumes will be absorbed by different markets. And uh, at the moment, if you look at the Chinese gas market, the way it will develop between 2012 and 2030, you'll see that um, the market niche uh, at the moment is negative because uh, the Chinese secured gas from Central Asia, they have gas from Myanmar, they have ga LNG gas contracts already, uh, which actually uh, could increase uh, the, in terms of how much LNG volumes China will receive. But market niche is, is negative around 2020 would become positive and we'll have about 60 BCM of gas available, uh, the niche available for on the Chinese market. And the question is, who is going to take over that niche? Is it going to be LNG volumes or is it going to be pipeline gas from Russia? And um, here again is, 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 I mentioned earlier, the pricing issue is not an issue anymore because Henry Hub as a benchmark is changing the attitudes of, of players in the Asia and, it's, changing, and it's, it's also changing the attitudes of Gazprom towards uh, the pricing issues with China. Um, Gazprom already signed a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese to supply 38 BCM of gas per annum for 30 years, a potential that could increase to 60 BCM of gas. Uh, one interesting thing is that Chinese uh, also uh, offered uh, to jointly transport and market that, that uh, Russian gas on Asian markets, which is a, you know, a, new, a brand new development uh, if you compare to the Chinese strategies, uh, you know, previously during the discussion of uh, gas supplies via Altai pipeline. Um, and um, here, uh, China is, is, is really in, 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 a, in, a, in a much better bargaining position in, in, in Russia because oversupply of LNG, if there is oversupply of LNG, China can absorb gas, gas volumes. If there is lack of LNG volumes, it can, it can absorb those, those, those additional gas volumes via power of Siberia pipeline. So um, for Russia, obviously, the challenge is whether it can become, uh, whether it can get access to additional Asian markets apart from China, uh, and whether it can, uh, it can become a swing producer, uh, as Gazprom always wanted, you know, so that it gets exposure both to European markets and to Asian markets. Um, and one important thing is that LNG logistics are better for China, for, for coastal areas in China, uh, and uh, Russians realize it. So, it's a, it's a, it's a quite a, a tough, uh, uh, tough competition. So, and I, and I think that uh, coming May uh, uh, summit, uh, we may see some, some uh, interesting developments uh, because, like I said, the external situation have changed, the domestic Russian domestic situation have changed, with gas from becoming under pressure uh, from uh, uh, increased pressure from other powerful players, including Igor Sechin, the, the president of Rosneft and also uh, other companies uh, associated with uh, putin era billionaires uh, such as Novatec. And uh, I will end here. If you have any additional questions, I'll be happy to answer this. Uh, some of these issues are further discussed in a special issue on China, which uh, Oxford Energy Forum, uh, which is a journal uh, published by Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, which will be available online, I think, by the end of this month. Uh, and then uh, there will be a working paper coming out uh, uh, end of April, May next uh, this year, uh, talking about when markets meet politics, consolidation and conflict in Russia's oil and gas sector, which looks at how uh, different forces in, in Russian oil and gas universe are changing Russian strategy, both towards Europe uh, and towards Asia. Thank you. Uh, 
good, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ma Bing, and it's my pleasure to make this presentation here. Uh, my presentation will be the Energy Club and uh, Energy Corporation of Shanghai Corporation Organizations. Uh, this is a corporation work between Li Fan Li and me. As some of you already know, Li Fan is a research fellow at Shanghai Academy of Social Science. We are working on the Shanghai Corporations Organizations Energy Corporation. My presentation will be the quick summary of this. On the September, uh, uh, on the September 23rd, uh, 2011, energy ministers of uh, China, Kyrgyz uh, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and uh, Tajikistan approved the CN initiative with the aim of uh, strengthening the establishment of the energy club of the SGO by, in by interaction with some former Soviet Union countries. On the last year's Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, uh, President Xi Jinping mentioned the, uh, mentioned the Energy Club again. Uh, this initiative, the new club should, should broad, broaden communication about energy strategies, policies, and uh, security issues, uh, promote technology cooperation, and uh, cultivate expertise among member countries. Uh, the club was proposed by then President of Russia, uh, Russia Putin during the summit held in 2006. Uh, a, project of the, uh, a project to strengthen communication, uh, synergy, and know-how, the club was designed to coordinate energy development and uh, transportation among countries in Central Asia and uh, to integrate the main consumer countries uh, such as China, India, and Pakistan. After, five, uh, after years of uh, exploration and uh, promotion, uh, the framework of the club was, uh, present, was presented as the CN Initiative. The CN Initiative identified the consensus among member countries, which are expected to take on the uh, Shanghai spirit of uh, mutual trust, mutual benefit, equality, coordination, respect for multiple cultures, and uh, search for a mutual development to develop energy cooperation. Uh, the club shall strive to expand communication, development, technology cooperation, and uh, cultivate expertise among member countries. The club will establish an open forum for governments, scientific institutions, and business groups. As senior executive, working group is being planned. The <coughs> attitude of China towards the establishment of the club depends on its, natu uh, uh, depends on its uh, national interests. Uh, generally speaking, the club may help strategic interests and also bring challenges to China. China's energy security can be ensured and uh, its new energy concept can be realized. Uh, consistent uh, high-speed growth drives oil consumption, which is uh, expected to rise uh, 300 million tons of uh, imported material by 2020. Uh, the Caspian Sea area could have a strategic role for China. Uh, given the greater energy cooperation with Central Asia, the rich oil from the Caspian Sea can play a uh, Significant, a significant role in the industrial development and uh, diversification of uh, supply in China. The current oil and gas supply of China depends on the Central Asia, uh, depend on uh, Middle East, which is uh, potentially unstable. Supply from Central Asia and the Caspian Sea may be more stable and uh, secure can offer more potential. Uh, the development of the Western region and uh, West East neutral gas trans transmission can be achieved. Can be achieved. Central Asia is an emerging energy center, and China can take advantage of uh, this to satisfy industrial needs in Xinjiang and address the future energy strategic reserve. Uh, thus, the oil gas transmission and pipeline of Xinjiang can be assured. Infrastructure such as railways, highways, and uh, optical fiber can be developed. The cities and the local way of life can be uh, revitalized. The pipeline from Central Asia can be designed as a channel for 
West East oil trans transmission, uh, which will save the cost of development in the Western region and uh, improve local infrastructure of China. Uh, the containment of Central Asia from Russia can be balanced. Russia and Middle a and, uh, mid and uh, Central Asian produce uh, pay close attention to the Asian market, uh, in which China stands as the stable and beneficial energy market. As member countries in the club, the producers should uh, consider the energy demands of the consumer countries and uh, provide favors of the priorities. The establishment of the club of the club can sustain opportunities for Chinese companies to participate in the development of oil and gas in Central Asia. So the conflict with Russia on energy price and uh, consolidated uh, coordinated energy group. Only when the pricing system among member uh, countries is confirmed can China and Russia launch extensive and uh, effective cooperation. The standpoint of member countries can be coordinated and uh, uh, international status can be enhanced. A network that uh, uniquely bring together producer and consumer countries, the, S the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Energy Club, contains consumers and producers both, which is uh, very different from IEA and OPEC. Uh, countries with different interests can, pro can cooperate and uh, search for mutual benefit in the international energy area, uh, which can further change the global energy map and uh, push the formation of uh, international energy orders. Uh, China is a strategic buyer whose orders are pursued not only by the U.S. but also by Canada. This status can give China a big C in the energy club, cont contrary to the conception of it as a passive player. Uh, though through, through planning and, and management, the relations between China, Russia, and uh, Central Asia can be strengthened. Uh, through role making in the club, internal conflicts can be avoided and uh, opportunities to participate in energy cooperation can be assured. In 2003, the first, uh, trans uh, the first transnational pipeline from China to, Kazakh to Kazakhstan was built. In 2005, uh, the Central Asia Pipeline and West East Transmission Pipeline uh, began construction in order to bring gas from Central Asia to Shanghai, Jiangxi, Guangdong, and many other provinces. By 2015, pipelines in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan will, will send uh, 40 billion and 10 billion cubic meters respectively to China, uh, which will push the adjustment of uh, energy structure and a mutual development. Uh, though, uh, though participation in Central Asia, Chinese companies can promote their global images and uh, took our international responsibilities. Petro-China's Beijing Hotel has become a land market in capital of Kazakhstan. The SEO Energy Club is a brand new cooperation mechanism because it consists of uh, countries of different types and interests. It can be very difficult to define and confirm the rules. Uh, nevertheless, China should pay attention to rule making in order to uh, bring, it line, uh, bring it in line with China's national interests and uh, values, and China want to do this. Uh, these are the summaries of uh, uh, our of, uh, of, uh, cooperation work, uh, but there are still some questions with, we should be careful when we discuss Shanghai Cooperation Organizations energy cooperation of China's Central Asia policy. Uh, security is the main issue of uh, China's Central Asia policy as well as uh, SAO. Although the economic cooperation, especially the uh, energy cooperation among SAO members is growing. Uh, energy cooperation among SAO members is not equal to energy cooperation of SAO because uh, many plans between uh, China and Central Asia states and, and uh, Russia is the bilateral way, not the, uh, not the multilateral way. Uh, and uh, it's not under the framework of uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, thank you all. Welcome comments and questions.